Hello beautiful people, welcome to the show, this is Her Moment, and I'm your host, Asha So my tell it happens every Friday from 5 to 6 p.m. and the repeat airs every Thursday from 10 to 11 p.m. Of course today we are going to be chatting with an awesome beautiful lady and of course many of you have been posting in our whatsapp groups and our social media handles and how about you get us this person would want to get up close with her and get to know what does she do how does she live okay this is what he said about her now this is the time we get up close and get to know the guest of the day is natalie vita tulo welcome to the show let's get this call Hey, Natalie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Asha. A beautiful evening, you look awesome, and you are the usual Natalie. I mean, someone would think, okay, now she's changed, but she is the Natalie <laughs> we see in the paparazzi. We look at um, and social media, and how is it going? Everything is fine. Thank you for coming to Skies Hotel. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had not told them where I hosted, but at Skies <laughs> Hotel in Naguru. Actually, we are at Club 99. Yes, if you they can always come and, you know. <laughs> well, uh, who take a look at the view? There's one thing, there's one beautiful thing I love about Skies. When you are at Skies, literally be like you're looking at the whole of Kampala. Do you at any time in the night get to the rooftop and Look around the city. Sometimes I used to live here, so I, I got quite used to it, seeing it every day. But we have four different blocks here at the hotel, so every block has a different view. So sometimes when I'm in one of the blocks that I don't go to every day, I still get caught by the view. You're like, okay, oh my wow, God, this take is a moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, for certain, who is Natalie? So my name is Natalie Bittitere. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm also the chief of staff at Simba Group of Companies. Um, I'm the daughter of Patrick Pitapere, a known businessman here in Uganda. And it's been an interesting journey, becoming an entrepreneur from a young age and now working my way through the different companies to work here at Simba Group. Oh, um, you talked about Patrick Pitapere. I mean, everyone knows about him. Everyone knows about him and people be like, wow, when by her looks, by what she does, being a business entrepreneur, scooping awards all over the world, I mean, the youngest entrepreneur, and people will be like, life was um, a silver plate for her. And people were like, okay, everything was there. How was your childhood life like? Did you also go to school like we used to sometimes and you meet people, or you used to be this girl who, you know, the van comes, meets her, and goes back home, and you know, and have piano lessons, and you know, the class of kids. How was your childhood like? Uh, I think I had a happy childhood. We were very <laughs> lucky. I have two brothers and a sister and a lot of cousins that I'm very close to. Um, I get a lot of questions about that kind of thing, about the silver spoon. I can't deny that I have been blessed to be born into a family that has provided with me with so many resources and opportunities. And I'm very grateful for it. And I don't take it lightly. I think when you are given the resources that I have been given, you have to take the responsibility to make sure that you make the most of it, that you give back to the community, that you share as much as you can, and that you do the best to your abilities to make sure it was not squandered on you. Many children are born into wealthy families, have all kinds of opportunities, and they don't give back to society, they don't make an impact, they don't make an effort. So I think it's also part of the responsibility of being so lucky, because we didn't do anything to be born into the families that we sure. did. There was no difference for me and another Ugandan girl born on the same day as me, except the family that I was born into. So I really take it upon myself to make sure that I can contribute as much as I can, because I don't think I was given the opportunities that I've been given for no reason. Oh. oh when we talk about child's childhood, like, what schools did you attend to in your primary? Um, so I was born in England, and I went to nursery school there. Then when I was in Uganda, I went to Rainbow International School. Then I moved to South Africa when I was 13. I went to Rodin Boarding School for Girls, which I did not like. So I moved back to Rainbow after a year. And then I moved to the UK to do my A-levels at Dean Close. And then I went to Keele University for my undergrad. And then I moved to California to do my master's in San Francisco. Someone has been born um, in London, why? And uh, you've been uh, to the 
ed- the other side of education and you compare it to Uganda, what is the most interesting bit of the education in Uganda as compared to that? It's funny, I actually did my dissertation in my undergrad on the different education systems. So I compared Uganda, Finland, and the UK to see the difference in the schooling experience. And I had a lot of questions about the Ugandan education system since I hadn't been through it. So I did a lot of interviews. And I found it so amusing how what my dad was taught when he was in school is what is still being taught. And then small questions like, why are we teaching Ugandans German? That no one was able to quite understand or explain to me. But I see the history of our education system and I understand why it was put in place. And now I see how the government is working to adapt it so that the skills that we're teaching young Ugandans are the ones that are going to be relevant for them once they're adults. Well, um, about uh, you being uh, going to, you finished from London, if I may say, what did they lead you pursue? Because some people usually will tell us, ah, I'm a successful businesswoman, but hell no, I did not do a business course, or I did not do this. Did you do you have such a kind of story, or you oh, no. or you're like, okay, I was a business minded person, and here I go, boom. I think when you grow up in Patrick Kitchener's household, there's no other option. So it was a big fight with me and my dad because I wanted to do education, I wanted to be a teacher, and so the compromise we did is we found a university where I could do education and business, dual honors. So that's what I did for my undergrad, and then growing up in business and working in business, after undergrad, I moved back and I started my own companies. And then I started to see a gap where I felt like it wasn't enough just to make a profit. So I wanted to understand more about how a business can make an impact. So I went to do a master's in social entrepreneurship. So I went to a business school, so you get all the benefits of an MBA, but you're on a special track where you understand social value and innovation and the different kinds of ways to measure it and to spread it and to grow a company that's a social business rather than a traditional one. Well, um, about, about your education, you look at you as someone who said, okay, I've grown up a business lady, I've grown up a business girl, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. What are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at your later ages, when you're yeah. still young. Did you do anything related to business or you, you would go to one of your dad's uh, you know, companies and you see them like, oh, here I am and I'm now today daddy's secretary. And <laughs> no, it's interesting. Uh, I think both. So from a young age, me and my siblings have always had businesses, like at school. We used oh. to get in trouble a lot at school because you're not you supposed saying? to have businesses. Anything you could take from the house that my mom wouldn't notice for a few weeks. So we'd have to assess and see, and then you start a business bit at school. I had different businesses where you sell stuff, like sweets or crisps. I had businesses where it was a service, and I would convince the maids at home that I eat a lot, so I need you to make certain sandwiches every day and pack them for school lunch, but I was selling the sandwiches or making a difference on the school money my mom would give us for lunch and then investing it in something else, convince the driver to stop at Shell so you can buy a packet of lollipops and sell them at school the next day for twice the price, small things like that. And we'd always get in trouble. Once my brother was selling used phones from Simba Telecom that people had returned and would be in stockpiled waiting for repair, and a phone fell out of his pocket at school, and the school called my parents, and my mother was so embarrassed. My dad is like, well done, my son. <laughs> this I is the see. business blood. So we've always been like that throughout, from probably the time I was 10 or 11, just because you grow up in the system. And when you're living at home with your parents as entrepreneurs, you're going to work with them, you're going to sites with them, you're working in the different businesses. And from the time I was about 14, my dad wanted us to work in our holidays. So it's funny, today I was talking to one of the interns at the hotel who was complaining his work is not interesting. I said, no, you have to start at the bottom. He was in the store counting stock. And I was trying to reminisce and tell him how I used to work in the store at Simba Telecom and the stores were underground. Mm -hmm. So you're in the darkness all day and I was so scared because I'm like, what if there are things in the boxes like rats and it smells of dust and you're not allowed to leave and you're counting the same things over and over. It was so boring and this was before internet so your phone doesn't help. But I think rotating in the different businesses, I worked in the different Simba shops, I worked in the stores, at Blitz Video and Ice Cream, like different places for a different week, few weeks at a time. And then by the time I was in university, I would work for my dad as his assistant or for different board members, sit, take notes, go here, follow up this, check this. Like basic busy work that you give interns. And it's boring and tedious at the time, but I think it exposes you to the business environment and it teaches you how to carry yourself. And also you learn, you pick up on different things, you listen to different things. 
So I think it's been a big advantage to grow up in a household like mine where everything is about business. Because once I was in the working world, I realized how much more I knew than my peers who had never worked or who were starting their first job like me, your first proper job, but they didn't understand what to do or the procedures or who to go for to yeah, certain sure. things. And I had already done all these things when I was younger. And it was easy. Yeah, it was much easier. Although when I was younger, I didn't have the right attitude. I thought it was a punishment and my friends don't have to work. Why do I have to do it? But once you're older, you learn to appreciate these things. Well, we are going to take a short, quick commercial break, but we'll be right back. Your story is Natalie Vita Torres. Let's get back. It's so important to be prepared, and yet I feel like so many people undervalue this so much. It's important to be prepared for the day. It's important to be prepared for an interview, for a meeting, for your job, for your dinner, for whatever you're going to go for. Life doesn't waste success on unprepared people. I know luck is a big factor, but really people make their own luck. It's about being ready when the opportunity finds you. It's about taking a moment before to think about what you're going to do. The amount of people who come to interviews and they don't even know what they're interviewing for, I just don't understand. The amount of people that show up somewhere unaware completely of what they're even doing there makes me wonder, what, why did you even come? This is an important part of being a responsible adult. No matter how much or how little you earn, you need to know how you spend. That is vital. So personally, I know how much money is coming in every month for me. The first thing I do is take off some for savings and I put it somewhere that I can't just get it easily. Next, I know my fixed expenses, yaka, water, groceries, things like that, that you know you need this much per month. And I know by this day of the month, I have to pay them. So those are obligations. It's not something I can decide against. It's not something I can spend money and not pay. So you have to set aside that amount of money. Then I get to see with the rest of this money, what do I need to pay for this month? What do I want to pay for this month? If I have a trip coming, I know I have to budget for that. If I need to buy something in particular, I have to budget for that. So that I'm always aware of what my current status is. Google, find out where you're going. If you're writing a cover letter, write it suited to the company that you're applying for. If you're applying for jobs in all different sectors, you cannot use the same cover letter. If you're going to make a presentation, do not just physically make the presentation and be like, okay, I'll figure it out. Practice it. Get someone's feedback. See if it's the right thing. Are you doing it in the right way? Is it answering the right questions? It's so important to be prepared. Even every morning, you should know what you're going to do that day. What are the important tasks? Where are you going physically? What is needed of you? Do you need to plan in the morning that I need to buy milk on the way home? You need to be able to be prepared for your life because being able to anticipate something helps you pre plan for the future. If you can use your historical knowledge, use the knowledge that's available to you now, whether you Google something or ask someone a question, you can plan better for the future so that you're more effective. You appear more professional. Your life is more organized. 